When building event-driven systems, we often encounter situations where we have duplicate or out-of-order events. When that happens, we need tools in our toolbox to help us deal with them. Duplicate events are often handled by ensuring that they are idempotent. An idempotent event can be applied multiple times without affecting the result. Think about adding an element to a list versus adding it to a set. Adding to a list is not idempotent. Each time you add an identical element to the list, it gets appended to the end. The list keeps changing. However, adding to a set is idempotent. The first time you add an element, it will update the set. However, if you try to add the same element again, nothing will change. Many events in your domain might be naturally idempotent, and you can take advantage of that. However, sometimes we have to manipulate the handling of an event to make it idempotent. One method for adding idempotency into your events is to keep track of timestamps. Each time you receive an event, you can record the timestamp. If you see a repeated timestamp, then you found a duplicate and can ignore it. However, in a highly concurrent system, two different events may share the same timestamp. In that case, storing the timestamp alone may not be sufficient. You may need to attach that timestamp to some other piece of identifying information, such as the entity ID. Another technique for building item potency is to embed version numbers into each event. In this case, the service that emits the event will create a version number for each entity. When the entity is updated, the version number will be incremented. Downstream, you can use these version numbers to deduplicate. If you see a duplicate version number, you can safely ignore it. However, be careful here. You can't have concurrent updates to a version number. If your version number is shared across all events, it eliminates concurrency. On the other hand, if you can limit the scope by attaching it to an entity ID, then you can still process multiple entities in parallel. Yet another technique for building item potency into your events is to track the unique identifiers. Each time you receive an event, you record its ID in a table somewhere. If you receive a new event, you can compare it against the table to see if you've already processed it. If it's a duplicate, you can safely ignore it. Periodically, you may want to purge the list of IDs if you know you won't see any more duplicates. Handling out-of-order events can use many of the same techniques we used for item potency. However, ensuring your events remain ordered has a new set of consequences to consider. If we try to handle our events in a concurrent fashion, then we lose any guarantee that those events will be ordered. Total ordering of events is generally considered the enemy of concurrency. For a system like CockroachDB to provide concurrency with ordering guarantees, a variety of sophisticated techniques have to be used, including ensuring your clocks are closely synchronized. Some databases even rely on atomic clocks to achieve this kind of ordered concurrency. Ordered handling of events can also lead to problems like head-of-line blocking, where slow events at the head of the line prevent later events from being processed. Depending on the queue being used, it may provide its own ordering guarantees. Kafka, for example, guarantees that events will be ordered within a partition. It's common to assign events for a specific entity to the same partition. This guarantees that the events will be received in order for that entity ID. However, the guarantee only applies within a partition. If you process multiple partitions, there's no guarantee of order between them. Furthermore, many entity IDs may share a single partition. This can exacerbate problems such as head-of-line blocking, where events for one ID can end up blocking events for a different ID. Much like with item potency, we can leverage timestamps or version numbers to help ensure ordering. In some cases, later events will supersede earlier ones. We may be able to store the timestamp, and if we see an earlier event, we simply ignore it. The same technique can apply to events that contain version numbers instead of timestamps. Alternatively, we can buffer our events for a period of time, 
and only process them once we're sure we have the correct order. When using Cockroach CDC, we can leverage resolved timestamps to indicate whether it's safe to flush that buffer or not. One way to do this is to consume the events from the queue, reorder them as required, and then push them back into the queue in the desired order to be consumed elsewhere. Remember that processing events in a strict order will limit your concurrency. Wherever possible, we should allow for unordered events. Tracking timestamps or version numbers can allow us to eliminate strict in-order processing since we may be able to discard older events. However, keep in mind that we will need some technique to synchronize our timestamps or to ensure our version numbers are accurate. There are always trade-offs, and there's no universal technique that applies to every domain. The important thing is to recognize those trade-offs and apply the techniques that best fit your use case. <music>